Hallelujah. Praise God. We thank God for another day that he has given to us that we will be able to come and share his word. This program is that the entrance of your words gives light. The entrance of your words gives light. It's a teaching program. We're teaching the word of God. And we have been on a topic that we are going to continue today. And that is lessons from actions. The Naaman story. We are on the sixth session. That means we've done five already. And today is number six. I'm praying that the Lord will teach us again from his way. You can get this program from Facebook. And then also you'll be able to get it from Rex Van Radio. Rex Van Radio has an app you can download on your phone and you'll be able to listen then also you can get it later from youtube these are different channels by which you'll be able to get this program i want to encourage you to share with your friends and loved ones so that they can also benefit from it before we go on we want to share a word of prayer Father, once again, we come before you. We are grateful for all the things you have done for us and continue to do for us. Even as we come before you this morning, we open up our hearts unto you and we pray that you will teach us that we will know how to walk before you. We give you praise and glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Beloved, once again, I want to welcome your soul, spirit, and body onto this program. And as I said, we want to continue with our topic, Lessons from Actions, the Naaman story. We are picking the characters that are involved in the story of Naaman. Naaman was a leper an army officer, an army commander who had leprosy and he got his leprosy healed. But the process from where he started off onto how he got his healing is what we have been looking at. And we are also looking at the individuals that played some roles. And we want to look at what they did and what we can learn from them. That is all that we are trying to do. Sometimes you read the scripture and then some of the things can go quick. But we just want to take time and then look at it again. The main text that we have been dealing with is from 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. And I want to read the whole passage now because we are more or less getting to the latter part of it. So the other characters involved, uh, we will need to read about them also so that we can get everything in perspective. So please permit me to go along with this lengthy reading, but at least that also refreshes our mind of the story again, in case you have not been able to read it on your own. So I will read from 2 Kings chapter 5. And I'm reading the whole chapter. It's up to verse 27 from the New King James Version. Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because by him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, 
Verse and verse said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Fapa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And the servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then? When he says to you, wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him. And he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, Then, if not, please let your servant be given two moon loaves of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Ramon, when I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman this Syrian, while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? 
And he said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Naaman said, Please take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them to two of his servants, and they carried them on ahead of him. When he came to the citadel, he took them from their hand and stored them away in the house. Then he let the men go, and they departed. Now, he went in and stood before his master. Elisha, Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groups, and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous, as white as snow. This is one of the sad stories in the Bible that I see. We will get to the end of it. But for now, we want to continue from where we left off the last time. And if you have been coming along with us, then you will know that we have talked about different characters. We talked uh, briefly about Naaman. Of course, he's the main character. We will come back to him. And then also we talk about the servant girl who initiated the whole thing, so to speak. We talk about Naaman's wife who didn't sit on that good news, but she disclosed to the husband. So the husband took action. And we talk about the servants also who intruded, if I should put it that way, when the man was, <coughs> um, how do I put it, was misbehaving or was not looking at reality. Okay. Then last time we talked about the Syrian king who also, in a way to help his servant, was actually miscommunicating, which could have resulted in something different. Okay, now we want to move on again and we want to touch on the other king. Two kings are involved in this story. And the other king is the king of Israel. The king of Israel. Remember last time we talked about so many different things as to what our miscommunication can bring along to us. Sometimes when we miscommunicate, we may get the wrong results or somebody can even get hurt. We want to take note of that. We wouldn't go back to it. But now we come to the one who is receiving that miscommunication, if I should put it that way, the letter from the king of Syria. And here we see, I'm not too sure whether this king was living in fear already, but from the look of things, he got the letter. We have read the whole passage, so now you have the full story before you. He got the letter and he was moved to a panic mode. Panic mode to mean that he has heard news from the king of Syria and he didn't feel comfortable about it. Why? Because of certain things that were in the letter. Remember last time we talked about it and he said that the way you read it, it shows. He said, now be advised. How do you address somebody or even start your letter with somebody that is supposed to help you. Now be advised. And of course, if you are somebody who has conquered them, uh, that fear is there. So to start a letter like that will naturally induce fear. It will put fear in the king. I don't blame him so much. He could do better. But from the tone of the letter, you see that, well, uh, there is reason for concern. Now be advised. I am sending my servant you <laughs> get him healed so the king of israel was afraid fear fear for most of us what is killing us is fear what is killing us 
is fear. The Bible says something that Jesus came so that he will save those who for fear of death. So it is not the death itself, but the fear of death. In all their life, they have become slaves. They are in bondage. So fear of death can wreak havoc in your life. Fear of death. Fear. You might have gone to the doctor and they might have told you something. Um, maybe some diagnosis. The diagnosis itself took longer. And when the diagnosis is taking longer, there is an indication that maybe that disease might be serious. Uh, I have been in places that doctors will come and tell you, oh, you have headache, maybe you have this, stomach ache, something. They come simple. You hear it and you are, it is, you are familiar with those terms. So it is not so much alarming to you. But you can also go to places and then they will tell you maybe the names of the diseases and that alone is reason for concern. <coughs> I was just trying to do a quick scan through some of the diseases. I got to know this and then it was just interesting to me. Cephalalgia, and this is maybe a medical term they will use. Then, I, as I mentioned it, you are wondering, where is it coming from now? We are preaching. Yes, it's part of the preaching. You went to the doctor, I said, you have cephalagia. And then you begin to scratch your head and it's like, where are my family members? We should prepare. I'm going. And all this means headache, you see? So there is a difference between somebody telling you cephalagia and then somebody telling you have headache, you see? So sometimes the news that we hear, if you don't sit down to analyze, it can put fear in you. You got that letter from the courts. And then all of a sudden you saw a part of it that, so because of this, um, the next time you come, the fine will be maybe 1,000, 10,000. They are going to fine you. You begin to wear. Where am I going to get this money from? <laughs> but have you taken time to read the whole letter? Sometimes you might see that they are saying that. So if you did it, if you don't turn up on the day that we are asking you to come, and you default because of your default, we will do this or that. So it's like something was preceding it, and then the part that you saw, which put fear in you, okay. Or you might even have had some letter from people who are dealing with your documentation. And then some of the things that they have said were the first ones you saw. And then you felt like, well, I'm going to be deported or maybe I'm going to be in trouble or something. But maybe they are asking you for the other document which you sent and they have not received. That we are giving you up to this time. If you don't send it, you are going to maybe face this or that. You see? The document, you already have it. You sent it only that they didn't receive it. Is this cause for alarm? But just the fact that you saw some part of it, you are alarmed and it puts fear in you. I'm trying to bring this to our attention that Sometimes you may hear certain news and it seems like it's so disturbing. Relax. And then even go back and read it again. Most of the times it happens. You will read and read and you see that it is not as serious as you heard it at first. So now, the king of Israel, he got the letter. Remember, the tone of the letter is different. Well, I would say it's different as far as what is the king is supposed the king of Syria is supposed to communicate? But the main agenda is get this man healed. And in the land of Samaria or Israel, we know that there's somebody who can heal him. So it is not action of the impossible, but then trying to connect the dots is very important. It's very important. So he begins to announce. I don't know who he will. Who he was talking to, but at least he got the letter. So somebody sent the letter to him. After reading the letter and being in panic mode, 
He says, look at this man, how he is beginning a quarrel. He's trying to get a fight with me. In other words, all of you be witnesses. And sometimes you may call people for witnesses for nothing. <laughs> there is no cause for alarm. So that is his first announcement. How could anyone heal leprosy? So now, well, I'm not too sure about this, but I should presume that if you are a king in Israel, and there is a prophet like Elisha in Israel, you should be aware of him. If you are not aware of him, well, that is another story for another day. But my, my take is that you should be aware of him. And now, you see, because of the fear factor, he has even forgotten of reality. And he's asking, how can anyone heal of leprosy? Of course, leprosy was also another thing. And with this, I will ask that let us try and seek for information. As I said, I'm using this example which will be clearer for us to understand. You went to the doctor and they said that you have this, 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 from braces, whatever, those long, long names. And then you sit there and say, ah, how did it happen? You can get another opinion or you may want to even go and read about it or take time to find somebody who can explain to you, get some information. It is very important. You do some research on your own, at least. Not to take the first word that is putting fear in you. Of course, if it is good news, and that is not what I'm talking about, but something comes to you and it seems like bad news, and you don't want to take that. You travel to a place, maybe you are looking for a job. When you got there, somebody met you and they get and said, Oh, they are no longer hiring. Oh, really? I just saw the um, advert yesterday. It's fresh. How come they are no longer hiring? Oh, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Then you look for another person to ask. Not just because they told you they are no longer hiring, then you come back. No, try and dig a little bit further. For all you know, help might be coming from somewhere. So that is what I am trying to advise. It can be a bad report, but then you want to probe further. You went to this school, and there is a lecturer that some people have done. As for this lecturer, he is bad. He is wicked. He is this. He is that. Maybe all that the lecturer is doing that every week there is a quiz. Every week there is an assignment. Every week there is this. That. So his course is so loaded and some students are not happy with that. They don't do it, in fact. And they are, they are failing. You want to find out what actually is the reason for them to say this lecturer is this and that and that. For all you know, they might not be learning. Some lecturers <laughs> are not so friendly. That is a different story. But what I'm trying to tell you, when you probe further, then you will know that uh, maybe it is not as they are saying it. <laughs> One time I was working with a, a friend. Well, not a friend. I'll call him a colleague. We just met at the workplace. And then he was saying, oh, these police people today, they, they are troublesome. They are this, they are that. Uh, you do business and then they will... Ah, I was trying to find out the kind of business this man is doing that he thinks police people are worrying him. And you couldn't tell me. Later, I got some indication that I think he was dealing with some other things. You know, other things. Okay. So if you are dealing with those things, the police will definitely worry you. Because it's illegal. You are not supposed to do that. So sometimes you want to find out what actually is going on. Assuming somebody just picks on that. Oh, I don't like police people because this guy says they are troublesome, they are worrying. You know, a story is different. You want to look at that. You go to a workplace, they tell you, ask for this supervisor. He is bad. He is wicked. He is this and that. You don't find out. And you also pick that he is bad. I'm talking about you receiving the bad report. And then acting on it, sometimes it will help to find out what is actually going on. So you just tell, oh, I wouldn't even want to work with him. You have not even met him. Maybe they might be the nicest person you ever met. Your friend told you his, that that supervisor is not good. Because even if they don't go to work or they go late, they will ask another person to clock in for them. And then later the supervisor found out, gave them a strong warning. Because of that, they feel the supervisor. There might be something. It is not your story. You want to find out what actually is going on. Remember, 
This teaching is just learning lessons. You look at what is going on, and we picking from that. We are picking some one or two things from that. So you want to get some more details about the information that has been given to you. Somebody started a business, it didn't work, and they tell no, 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 ask for this business. No, no. Maybe they were not serious at it. Maybe they didn't get the right information. So as soon as you want to do it, they tell you, oh, this business, oh, forget it. You buy into the idea, you keep your money before you realize the money is funded. You have spent the money. Whereas if you have invested it in the business, it could have maybe you done something. You are not them. You are hardworking. In fact, more hardworking than them. But because of maybe their laziness or maybe misinformation, misguidance or something, they couldn't make it and they told you you also bought into it. Find some, get some information and then move on. You want to get married and then some people say, hey, marriage? You said you want to marry? Ah, uh, Maybe they got into their marriage some four, five, nine, three hundred years ago and it didn't work for them. They have, they have drawn the curtain and they have concluded that marriage is not good. So when you wanted to marry, all that they told you that as for marriage, forget it. Some men will tell you, oh, for the women, they think they have rights, they will take everything from you. Why would you want to go and marry a woman who is going to take everything from you? Uh, when did that the two become one happen? You see, you are not going in there to get divorced. Let us understand. There may be things that will come alongside the marriage. Of course, that is why you need to be prayerful enough to get the person that should be your spouse. That is another topic. But the point I'm making is that if you are careful enough, if you are not playing tricks around, some of you, when we tell you to wait, you think uh, uh, that is maybe somebody not knowing the world well, so telling you whatever they think. But it, it pays to wait. You are, you are treading on dangerous waters. You need to know how you play your cards, not just gamble around. You just gamble and then you pick anything and then it becomes a problem for you. When you wait on God, God will give you the best. Okay. Things can happen. Challenges will come. Once you come together as a couple, you can resolve it. But somebody pollutes your mind with this wrong information, misinformation, misguidance, that for marriage, forget it. So even if you are in marriage, now your mind is no longer in your marriage because you think that there is nothing worthwhile in marriage. You want to know that you need to get your own information. Some people, their marriage, if you look at it, you will want to marry. So what I'm trying to say is that the fact that somebody gave you a wrong information doesn't mean you need to base all your hopes on that because there may be something at the other side. You want to think about that. Okay, now let me come back again to this king of Israel, remember, he got a bad report. Now he doesn't know what to do, and he is just saying things for himself. Sometimes you need to seek for help. The other part of it, I was talking about you seeking more information, but sometimes too, you need somebody to help you. You need somebody to help you. This king is not helpless. In fact, he thinks that the king of Syria is coming to attack. He's seeking for a quarrel. So that is his concern now. I believe he might be thinking of how to assemble, get his army assembled, ready for something. But that is not actually the case. You only need to get somebody to help. You are a king. You are not a healer. So understand it from that angle that what's next? What can I do to get this issue resolved? Of course, for all you know, even though the king of Syria is sending this letter in a tone that seems like he's coming for war, he, he's bringing trouble. How about if you are able to resolve it, wouldn't that sort of bring some cordiality in your relationship? So you want to seek for help, somebody who can help you. And let me chip this in. In talking about help, in life, you can get to the end of yourself that you do not know where to turn again. And in fact, as I speak, there might be somebody who is listening to me that you are contemplating 
on committing suicide because you think you have come to the end of yourself. There is no one to help and you don't want to be a laughing stock. So you feel like when I take out my life, I am fine. I'm no more there and then the story ends. <laughs> it is not as easy as you are thinking. There is more to it. I want to appeal to you that you seek for help because there is help right where you are. And I pray that if you are that type, may the Lord touch you right now, wherever you are. Many people die in silence. They take their own life because they don't seek for help. There are people who can help you. One time I saw a video clip. It seemed interesting, but it set me thinking. I'm not too sure whether it was a real thing that happened or maybe they were dramatizing. Sometimes this drama might be about somebody's story and they are trying to uh, paint it in a way. I saw this man in the video. He had gone to the forest in the bush place that where nobody would see him. And then he had put a robe on a tree and he wanted to hang himself. So he was just going to put his head in there and then drop and then he would hang himself. Before he will get close to the rope, there was a gunshot. Boom! He turned around and then just started running. Well, I, I look at the video and at first sight it was like, oh, so what is going on here? Then it set me thinking that this man wants to take his life. Fine. He's going to a place that there's nobody. Fine. But now he hears of a gunshot. Gunshot means somebody is shooting. Whether they are, they are looking for some antelope or uh, some bushmeat or whatever. That is a story, a different story. But he's stretching. He feels like somebody is shooting. And I need to run for my life. Running for the life that was coming to destroy? Can you imagine that? So what set me thinking is that what is actually going on in their mind? Maybe they are not really looking for death. That is the point I'm trying to make. So for the people who may commit suicide, it may not necessarily mean they want to die. They have gotten to a point that they feel there is no reason for them to live because living is a shame for them. I pray that the Lord will turn your situation around if you have gone into such a situation like that. It could be about your relationship with somebody. It could be about your business. It could be about your health. It could be about anything. That you feel like, well, it will be better if I no longer live. I'm here to tell you that Jesus can save you from that situation. That is the message we are presenting. For Naaman, he was sick of leprosy. And then he was able to get to a man of God who healed him. As I preach, I'm preaching the gospel that brings peace unto you. And also brings healing unto your body. So it could be healing of your mind, it could be feel, healing of your physical body, it could be anything or some situation you have gotten to. Jesus is the answer to that problem. Do not destroy your life. Now, coming back to the story, looking at people seeking for help, there are another question that we also want to ask, which sometimes disturbs me, if when people want to seek for help, sometimes where do they go for the help? Depending on your situation, help could be anywhere. But sometimes you see that even the people that are supposed to help you, they can make your case worse. Remember, we are learning lessons from these stories. So we may cut from left, right, front, back, top, bottom, middle, everywhere. So now I'm coming to the point where one, People need to seek for help so that they can move on in their life. But sometimes to the people who are going to help, they may get your information and they may spread it. Confidentiality, even in the church. Now, people cannot confide in other people. They will be telling you their story and it's like, oh, I got him, I got him. Whilst you are narrating your story, oh, now you see my difficulty is that I don't even have a car. I have to walk uh, to work and come back and oh, so with all the bracket and now you don't have a car. That is what is going on in your head. Before you even finish the conversation, the other friend knows the story. Confidentiality in the church. And this breaks the heart of many people. In fact, 
you make their case worse. It is like you stabbing them in the heart. People cannot confide. The Bible said that we should bear each other's burden. In so doing, we will fulfill the, the law of Christ. How often do we bear each other's burden? Sometimes, out of competition, whatever that competition is, we will want to sell the story of other people to others so that we become popular or we become the man or the woman on the ground. What do you gain from that? We are supposed to help each other. I want to ask you, how ready are you to help others? Even in your darkest moment, how ready are you to go the extra mile with them? Are you the type who is looking for opportunity so that you can send information about those people that are in need, even those people that are in, in need of your support to others, making their matters worse? We need to support each other. People need help. They need to ask for help. But then people also should be able to give help, to offer help in such a way that those who need the help will be very comfortable with it. I'm talking about even church. Even church. If you live in church and people cannot have that confidence, then there is a problem. Those who gossip, those who backbite, those who slander. Here is an advice for you. There are those who are hurting, and it is you and I. Last time, God was doing a checkup. He called on King. He said, where is your brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? Many of us, silently, that is what we are doing. We are not our brother's keeper. We will say it with our mouth, but the actions are telling that we are not our brother's keeper. This morning, I am speaking to you about the king who got that miscommunication or mis... Uh, yes, I'll call it miscommunication, not misinformation, miscommunication. The man, the, the, the Syrian king didn't communicate well and it became a problem for him. And now he's worried and then he's even thinking, who can do this? Meanwhile, there is an answer around. People need help. People need help out of their situations and you and I can help. I will not continue because my time is up. But I will just want to let you know. Next time, we are going to talk about Elisha. Elisha is the prophet of God. And be ready for that. <laughs> we are going to talk about a lot of things here. Remember, we are learning lessons from here. So now Elisha hears the message Whichever way he got to know it. And then, oh, tell the king to direct this man to me. Simple. Can you imagine that? Something that goes to one person and they feel like, well, I'm in trouble. Another person relaxes comfortably and he's inviting that thing onto himself. Each of us have our own abilities. Each of us have our own capabilities. Each of us have our strengths, our weaknesses. We need to be each other's keeper. So that at least... We can help. I can't imagine the kind of relief the king of Israel would have felt when Elisha said, that, let him come to me. By the way, you want to be aware of things that are around you. Sometimes, out of ignorance, we, we get into difficult situations. Look at this king of Israel. Elisha is there. The situation has been presented to you and you are struggling. Just look around. Look for people who can help you. By the way, let me say this in conclusion. You may have friends around you, but your friends cannot always help you in your situation. Sometimes we can brag about, oh, this is my friend. I do everything with them. No, there may be a friend who is very good in business. When it comes to business things, they are very good. There may be a friend who may be very good in spiritual matters. They are very good. In fact, there may be a friend who is very good as far as marriage and other things are concerned. They are there. Some friends are very good when it comes to parenting. Maybe all those things are there. Some friends good when it comes to education. You need to know which friend you are talking to about which situation. You go to the friend who is so spiritual and then you talk to them about this uh, issue. Maybe about 
your wife, your husband, you have a, 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 a situation in your marriage. And this is at the verge of collapse. You need somebody to sit both of you down and then talk to you. And this friend said that, let's pray. I'm not saying prayer is no good. You have been praying for the past 40, 40 hundred years, whatever years. The, 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 the answer is still on the way coming. You need somebody to talk to and to know what actually is going on. They can offer advice, simple advice. This person said that give them seven weeks so that they can fast and pray. You will sit there and rot. What I'm trying to say is that they, they don't get it. Simple. This businessman is there. You are looking for business opportunities. And then you are looking for the other friend who is more into pleasure and leisure. If you want entertainment, if you want vacation, if you want this, that. They are very good. And now you are talking about business plan. They want the business money to spend on vacation. Be careful. Know the person you are asking for the advice from. Well, a word to the wise. I just stand it there. What I'm trying to seek the advice, seek the help from the appropriate quarters is important. Now, we have Elisha, the man of God, whom we are going to talk next. We talk about the king of Israel. Remember, we are learning lessons from the Naaman story. Next week, God willing, we are going to continue. Before I will sign off, all that we are teaching here, all that we are speaking about, all that we are, we are preaching is about Jesus in the sense that man has fallen from the glory of God because of sin. And as a result of sin, there are so many things that have been pushed on us. That is why it is difficult to live our lives. And we can only have peace back with God when we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The Bible said that he came to this world to pay the penalty for sin so that we can have relationship back with God. For Naaman, he was healed of his leprosy. I don't know the situation you are going through, but the bottom line is that we do not have peace with God because of sin. And therefore, if for any other thing to happen, that peace needs to be restored. I don't know what you are going through. I mentioned about somebody who might be disturbed somewhere and is even contemplating taking their life. The answer is Jesus. It's more than if you do not have a relationship with him. Wherever you are, I want you to lift up your two hands and you repeat this prayer after me. It's a sign of surrender. You give your life unto Jesus and he will direct your ways. He will become Lord and he will become your savior. Lift up your two hands wherever you are and then repeat this prayer after me. After that, I'll pray with all of us. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and that you died for me. Therefore, this morning, I accept you as my Lord and personal Savior. I will serve you all the days of my life. Amen. Please put your hands down and then we will pray together. Once again, Father, the entrance of your words has given us light, shining on our path so that we will know where we are. There are those on this line who see the need to surrender their life unto you such that they can have peace with God. In this life, there is no peace. But with you, there is peace. And not only that, you are going to be their Lord and Savior. Even as they have surrendered unto you this morning, I lift them up unto you. I pray that you direct their paths and you reveal yourself unto them individually. That they will walk with you all the days of their lives. We want to thank you for what you are teaching us this morning. Many are the things that we hear that melt our hearts away out of fear. But this morning you want us to know that there is help around. And we don't just have to take some of this information 
on the surface. We can dig into it and we may even see that it's not as serious as we see it. But the most important thing is that when our faith is resting on you, then we know that regardless of the situation, it is well. We pray this morning that you will help us understand this so that our faith will rest in you. We will not think of our strength of our, of our might, but we will rely on you. In that regard, we will not be afraid. As I pray, if there is any on this line or who will hear me after this, and they are gripped with fear, I cast out that fear in the name of Jesus. And I speak for faith into their lives. I pray that, Father, you will restore them. We give you praise for another day as we go out from here. Let our mind, our thoughts, our focus be centered on you. That we will make you the center of our lives. Be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Beloved God, richly bless you for making the time to come and listen to the word of God. For those of you who have accepted the Lord Jesus, I want to encourage you to find a Bible-believing church where you can fellowship and grow in your walk with the Lord. I fellowship with the Church of Pentecost. We are everywhere. You are welcome to fellowship with us. Then also for all of us, I want to encourage you to share this message and then also go back and then read. And I believe there are more lessons you may be able to glean from it than even what you are sharing. Remember here we are bound by time. Until we meet next week to continue with this discussion and this study, I say the Lord richly bless you.